squat, scorn. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the Antoine Dupont of website builders. Sometimes we get too caught up in the heroes with grandiose destinies. The hero of a thousand faces who must embark on an epic quest to vanquish evil, be it Darth Vader or Leinster, is a story told over and over again, a narrative found so often within sports. We look for the chosen one, the special kid who can do things simply nobody else can do. This year's Premiership Final felt built for one such icon. We had George Ford against Owen Farrell, Chris Ashton against Elliot Daly, Ellis Genge and Jasper Visa against the collective and the Polars. One of the fated few would step out of the darkness and save the day. But sometimes, perhaps, we can get too caught up in the heroes of grandiose destinies because legends can come from all around us. You could scour all of rugby and you wouldn't find one person with a bad word to say about Freddie Burns, as lovely, genuine and committed a bloke as rugby's ever produced, and yet you could scour his entire career and you'd find very little where he is the focus. A lifetime of propping up those whose destinies seemed more star-crossed, stumbling between clubs to become a favourite with the fans but never a hit with the masses. And so, on a day made for those heroes who embarked for the epic, those who've become world stars, and a match made for one huge moment from one such man completing his hero's journey. What journey could ever be more worthy than that of a journeyman? Seeing Freddie Burns bring the Premiership title to the Tigers was a rugby moment I don't think any of us will forget anytime soon, rounding out an excellent team and tactical performance to blunt the usually lethal Saracens team and help his side lift the trophy for 2022. So, how did Leicester Tigers win this game? You know, aside from the Freddie Burns strong goal, which I'll get to, but whew, how did Leicester Tigers win the Premiership and put Saracens back in their place. Sadly, it was frankly a quite perfect tribute to Leicester's season, ugly in the most compelling ways, requiring a complete 23-man effort as each player just trusted the one next to them implicitly to go above and beyond. Each player in this Tigers team understands not just their role perfectly, but that of the players around them. It ranges from the tiny, such as Richard Wigglesworth here pushing the bigger unit Jasper Visa into Sean Maitland's way, to everything shown in the excellent first try by Hanra Liebenberg. It's all about leveraging their togetherness and creating separation within Saracens and begins here, the dummy ball has become a popular tactic in the last few years, but it's almost always called off an eight-man line-out, meaning all eight opposition forwards are called in. However, it means you tend to get a couple of forwards waiting on the fringes like this, and so to prevent this happening, Leicester calls for a five-man line-out and form a dummy ball. For Nepal, the charge is in, meaning Earl is alone in this channel here, and he has to watch Wigglesworth, opening this separation between the pack and the backs. For Nepal, notices this, so slows, hangs back to cover it, meaning Porter is now carrying one-on-one -on -one against George, and his run-up lets him bounce him and keep bouncing on was like a pinball on a wild night out. Saris are content with just two front rowers then peeling around on the open side, but Leicester set to separate again. Their first goal is essentially to split Farrell and Earl here off from the players inside and outside them. This is a really well-timed dummy run by Matoja, and it draws Farrell and Cock in for a second, meaning Earl turns his eyes onto Genge. But as that's happening, another RG Tiger has run a great dummy line. Moroni physically places himself between Earl and Tompkins. It's a deliberate block, but it's never going to be penalised because the ball isn't coming anywhere nearby. However, Tompkins does do brilliantly. He slows down, doesn't get drawn in, and manages to cover two men, meaning Daly should just be able to watch Stewart on his own, take care of it simply. But he isn't, and he doesn't. Daly, being a utility back, defends according to the Saracen system rather than the situation. Now and now centre here probably knows he has to stand off, backtrack and soak up some pressure for the next phase. Daly is so used to playing 16 positions often in a single match that he just defends on kind of autopilot instead of reading the situation itself. And more importantly, doesn't trust Tompkins. Which, you know, I've seen him play for Wales, I don't blame him. But his tiny Welsh Prince of Chaos has just read the situation perfectly and Daly does something just completely different, shooting up and allowing Stewart to shoot past him. Ashton could then easily cut round and in field, but wants to make the pass as simple as possible for Stewart, staying away from Saracens, so sticks to the wing. Knowing he won't score himself here, but steps in field to set a target for his support to clear out. Tigers then play in field and Saracens scramble well, covering the space. However, Genji here lifts the ball subtly off the floor, which means Liebenberg doesn't need to get low in order to pick and go. He can dictate his own height and with it, the terms on which he takes the tackle. Shoulder on shoulder, but Napola slips off and Dan Cole makes an excellent outside latch. He spins and essentially just tackles Nick Tompkins, preventing him from adding any force to the hit and allowing Liebenberg to propel himself over the line for the try. It's such a showcase of what Steve Borthwick brings to this team. Sheer rugby nows and so many subtle ways to be a better utter bastard. And whilst bastardry is usually the forte of forwards, every element of Leicester's game is imbued with the spirit of shithousery. And Borthwick, of course, got everyone on the same page with one special little tool. Squarespace. 
Not just a great place to show off his amateur photography skills, but using everyone's favourite website building, he was able to catalogue comprehensively the best ways to get under the skin of an opposition, dedicating easy to create beautiful to view pages to moments such as here, the lineout catcher backing into a Toje, Saracen's main disruption threat, meaning he isn't able to get through, allowing his team to give him plenty to talk about on the entire blog on mall technique, keeping his forwards updated on the greatest and latest heave news. He can put together stat packages on what works at rocks and then receive stats and analytics on them and how many people read them. On top of this, on top of this, on top of this, this is the most exciting bit. He can get 10% off the final price by heading to the link in the description using the offer code SQUIDRUGBY to make his own beautiful website just like you can, just like you want in the video right now. You can do that as well, you can do that as well. You can go make a video on forwards or anything you want, anything in the world you want. Tigers deployed a brilliantly bastardry kicking game too. A Saracen to a team who feed off defense. You know that thing in video games where you need to charge up a special move by countering, dodging, and parrying? That's essentially the Saracen's game plan. They're a team who want you to have the ball so that they can turn you over, watch Earl and Atoja hoop and waller for a few minutes before they kick downfield, score, and crush every part of your spirit at once. They're an incredibly physical team, but whereas, say, South Africa try to melt you entirely in one go, Saracens like to squeeze you for just a few seconds at a time, then shoot you in the face while you're checking on your wound. There's a number of ways they do this, but one is their love of double tackles. The first guy hits aggressively and the second guy drops him to ground. We can see it perfectly, repeatedly, in this great passage defence from the semi-final. Bolstered by the aggressive 13, Daly smashes Smith, Saracens smell blood, turn the ball over, and as defence turned into attack, Farrell threads for a beautiful kick that Kerr fumbles under pressure. It's not as dramatic as Ben Hill's hat-trick score coming from a turnover on their own line, but it's a death by a thousand cuts effect that normally leaves every opponent bleeding so hard their skin is redder than a real tiger. Knowing they could never prevent or nullify it entirely, Leicester looked to limit the damage Saracens could do through their kicking game. Four times in the first 20-ish minutes, Tigers forced this kick. It's not a kick actually targeting any space, it's simply about making Saris adapt later in the game. Because Ali Davis at 9 defends mostly in the backfield to allow his wingers to defend in the main line, Saracens expect the main line players to be able to turn and cover a chip here. As Ford stabs it through here, there are two men on him. Both bodies now just wasted resources. Or here, Stewart draws Davis up and stabs through this excellently, leaving Sarri scrambling. Good recovers, but as he goes to ground, just watch Ashton. He spots the ball and just flops towards it. Ashton's not a threat, he's not going to do anything, but Good just instinctively moves the ball away and it hands Leicester a 5 metre scrum. And again, right after half time, once advantage is called, Burns stabs this through to just make sure Sarri's haven't forgotten what they're doing. It all prompted the Saracens to think slightly more before flying up. Even in the final passages leading up to the drop goal, this sniper by Hatojo is possibly the only example we ever saw of them applying that pressure. Even under the most extreme circumstances of their season, they ended up thinking more about soaking it up than applying their usual tactics. Forced to consider so many other options by the variety in Leicester's kicking game, and by the fact they kicked so much itself. Saracens are a team who want you to have the ball so they can crush you with it, but Leicester just gave it back. With a backline of otherwise natural right footers, Borthwick swapped in left footer Richard Wigglesworth to replace team icon Ben Youngs and it granted him the ability to kick in every situation. It allows him to escape a toja on the other side and hang this kick, which might seem empty but he's deliberately targeting for the pole. And now, every up and under gives the team three attempts to apply pressure. One is aerial, which speaks for itself, the next is the following breakdown, this was something the Lions really targeted last year, but the third is the following phase, with the team previously defending now racing back to set shape and structure now they're on the offence. This last approach is how Tigers look to use their kicking game most often. It's a chance to attack and attack at its most vulnerable whilst they're still setting up and push them backwards. So by kicking directly to Vanapola, Wigglesworth is handing the ball to the only Saris player who won't kick it back himself, hoping to pressure them the following phase. And whilst this example is something we'll come back to, the same idea leads to the second try for Tigers, eventually scored by Jasper Visa. Once again, Tigers target Vanapola. No interest in contesting aerially, the Tigers make the tackle and show no interest in contesting on the ground either, letting Sarri set up. However, whereas some teams look to disrupt whatever the next phase is, if we glance back over Tigers' season, they love instead to target the next phase where the ball goes to 10, and put all the resources into that, targeting the opposition fly half. And this is no exception. Richard Wigglesworth starts in the sweeper position, but once he spies the ball coming out, he absolutely thunders in to put pressure on Farrell, making this charge down. But, anticipating the bounce of the ball, Wigglesworth doesn't charge to it, but instead looks to get in support of Ashton once he regathers. Wiggins finest then stabs for an incredibly clever kick, whilst the bounce is awkward for Moroni, it puts the recovering Farrell under pressure to do some untermax shit, but Wiggins second finest can't do anything worth proposing to, and it gifts Tigers the scrum five 
all from smartly targeting the phase after the kick. They then win a penalty from the resulting scrum and run an incredibly smart two-phase move. So, Saracen's set like this. Forwards bumps before Genge, and then Goud and Maitland covering 15 metres here, in case Tigers do something requiring thinking rather than thumping. This is a pretty standard setup. You see backs defending the wide channels because it's their forte on this kind of tap move all the time. But instead of running at its most direct path, Genge launches himself diagonally at the furthest out forward. This means Goud has to step in as the guard. Meanwhile, Jasper Visa starts on the open side, but wraps round last second. Sari's forwards are watching him until it's too late. He's thundering into only good alone, allowing him to smash through probably the last man Saracen would want there, and under him, over the line. Now, if we look at the previous phase, Mauro Otoje, who'd be far better in that situation, starts to linger behind this ruck. If good isn't here, Otoje likely takes position and stops Visa before the line. However, because it's marked, Otoje stands behind, figuring this is a pick and go coming next from Leicester, and it will give him an opportunity to swoop in and win a turnover the following phase. He's thinking all about that. When Visa instead comes charging, Otoje spots here, he's the first to react, but the South African arcs excellently onto good's outside, meaning his own teammate gets in Otoje's way of making the tackle. Otoje's maybe Saracen's greatest weapon, his turnover's often season-defining, but Tigers were able to utilise his own potency and ability against them. However, being one of the smartest sides in pro rugby, Saracen's altered a great deal of the tactics at half-time, daily moving onto the wing and looking to kick sooner to counter Tigers' second-phase strike. And so, when Van der takes the ball on that previous example, he bullocks to buy time before offloading to Maylands, who pumps it long. Knowing Daly and Farrell have bigger boots than anyone in the Tigers team, Saracens are looking to just hit it long, each kick here, and force Tigers backwards, in hope they concede the duel and just put it out in the fold, giving Saris a big net gain. However, Tigers are approaching this with entirely different kicking tactics, hitting it into this corner repeatedly to try and pull whoever's covering it up and out of line, knowing Saris encouraged the kicker to chase the kick themselves. After a couple of bouts, Farrell sees what they're doing and changes tactic. He doesn't want to get cut out. Whilst Burns can recover, he's under pressure and forced to run. Stewart does unbelievably well to regather and stab kicking behind instead of being bundled into touch, but it presents Saris with an opportunity. Farrell is still getting back to his feet, but he hears a call from Good and slots into 10 to play wide to wide. Daly then puts in a cheeky kick, and suddenly Tigers are under enormous pressure, in their own 22 with 50 22 threat, meaning Potter has to play here, but knowing they can't contest aerially then, Tigers charge at the breakdown, Montage winning a brilliant turnover. But Saris instantly pile pressure on Wigglesworth, meaning his kick is hurried, and Saris get back on top. Good sees this as an opportunity to do exactly what they wanted to do all along. They're looking to just find grass and turn Tigers around, so he does it, thumping it behind Potter and forcing him to rush another kick, giving Saris a prime opportunity to counter. Tigers are totally disorganised, and Saracen's set. However, with Farrell calling for the ball, Max Malins comes in off his wing and essentially intercepts it. Farrell is enormously pissed off by this, because he's just blown the chance, right? If Malin holds his position, Baby Faz probably isolates Moroni here and puts Malin's away down the wing. It's certainly a chance for them to attack in the 22, if not a try. But instead, Malin's is now charging into contact because he wanted the ball early. And Tommy Reffel is in position. It's a lightning quick turnover, and Stewart rushes up to exploit a disorganised Saracens. Daly trapped on his own and forced to surrender the duel and give less of the ball in Sarri's territory. This was a great metaphor for the game as a whole. Saracens played this passage smarter, the tactics all organised and effective, but Leicester's resolve, instincts and reactions were so strong that the moment any Saracen deviated from their plan, they could smash them back 60 odd metres. And this kicking game was vital for the moment that eventually saw the 2022 Premiership come home to be found at the car park in 70 years time, and Freddie Burns become an eternal legend of Leicester Tigers rugby. Having been at the game, I didn't think we'd hear a louder cheer all day than the one when pre-match entertainment Sophie Ellis Bexter said this next one's called Murder on the Dance Floor, and yet Tigers were able to deliver it right at the death. Being there also gave me a different perspective on this moment. With Leicester in possession in the Saracens half, Ben Youngs makes his first snipe since about 2012, and the Tigers keep pressing. But Saracens aggression is back, smashed in the tackle. Leicester need to regroup, so we're on a quick phase to generate a quick ball, and Burns looks to play wide once just to see if anything's on. It isn't, so Youngs takes over. Most Tigers fans around me despaired as Young showed to kick it, but I think it was kind of an ingenious moment of game management. Jasper Vita clears out way beyond the ball, dragging Rawai in, then just holding the back of his jersey, tugging him slightly, meaning there's no pressure on Youngs. Yet, because he hasn't formed a caterpillar, no Saracens drop back out of line until after the kick is already in the air. Before he hits it, we can also see Youngs glance over at this far right corner. Malin sat incredibly deep, so he hangs it over his own head to just land outside the 22. Not only does this mean Malin can't call the mark, it means he has to travel a hell of a long way to get there and work around his own players dropping back late in order to get there. This kick wasn't a hit and hope by Youngs, it's calculated and tactical to catch Saracens out, and Malins drops it right into the arms of Pride of Sleaford Ollie Chesham, and Tigers are back on the attack 
and play it right away into the middle of the field. Last week, I talked about how in this passage against Bristol, Ford set his body language to say drop goal the entire time, when he was only ever thinking of the try, really. And here, Burns does exactly the opposite, wanting to appear as though the DG hasn't occurred to him, looking only for the five points. This allows Stewart to make a great carry, and for the next six phases, Burns appears as though Leicester want to be playing off ten. He's giving passes, standing flat, weighing things up, whilst, frankly, letting Youngs make the decisions. Even here, as he's slotting into the pocket, he's pointing his arms and making it look like he's flashing to the other side, as though he's still wanting to attack. But he's not. And Leicester know this. One more phase, and Youngs is going back into the pocket. However, Saracens know this too. And they have Mario Atoje on their team. Maybe the most prominent charge down threat in the whole world. And he's looking behind, watching Burns plotting his route through the Leicester forwards to him. So, Youngs throws it to the dude stood right in front of Atoje, and Visa is able to make the most important carry of his season, wriggling through jaws to ensure Atoje has to complete the tackle on him. Hayes and Ashton then pin Atoje at the bottom of the ruck, making sure he can't get up. Ashton even appealing to the referee that his handiwork might be a penalty. You know, it's, it's worth asking. Youngs then dummies the pass back to give Earl a bit of a false start, making him think twice, but it's only a momentary ruse. The ball goes back to Freddie Burns. Stood to the right of the post because he kicks across his body with 20 seconds to go so he can get a second shot if he misses it. He doesn't. Twickenham erupts. One year ago, Burns missed this incredibly hard to track down drop goal to put his side Toyota Shuttles into the Japanese first division. Two years ago, this infamous drop ball cost Bath a win over the European champions to be. Burns' career has rarely been easy, but it means moments like Saturday came the hard way. It's easy to celebrate George Ford or Owen Farrell, second generation freaks brought up in high level environments. Dan Carter, a man with talent beyond any other, or even Dan Big or George Shop Sex Frog, with gifted a drive to nasty and perfectionism that acts as their superpower. But Freddie Burns is us. He's what could have happened if one of us, watching this video, attending Twickenham in the stands, tuning in to watch it on TV, had sacrificed that extra 5% every single night. Freddie Burns isn't a guy who got where he is purely on talent. He got there through an optimistic belligerence, working harder than others had to to get the same results. And so, to see Burns be the one who secures the prize that every single one of the 195,000 male rugby players in England dreams of winning. That, for me, is a hero. Leicester are a team of players who innately trust each other, and it feels as though there could have been no other way for them to win this game. A second string icon entrusted with a moment usually reserved for those with the grandiose destinies. Nick Mullins screamed on commentary that this was the greatest moment in Freddie Burns' life, but perhaps it's actually more than that. It's a moment made for all of us, a universal beat for every rugby fan who was never born with Bowden Barrett's genetic gifts, and one that will now go down forevermore as one of the most iconic from the Premiership's storied history. It's a moment for the hero in all of us, who we all could have been if only we'd sacrificed the extra 5% every night. Thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed it. I only had time to do one of the finals. I was hoping to get through maybe the Super Rugby or the USB final as well. Um, I had to make a choice on one of them, so I've only had time for this one, I'm afraid. But I do have friendly South Africans who wanted to see the USB final covered. Do have something perhaps um, you might like coming next week instead ahead of the uh, tour series against Wales. So that might be worth being interested in potentially. I also want to thank BT Sport for taking me to the to Twickenham to have a look around. They showed me the changing rooms as I showed them there. Um, Ugo Monia FaceTime my mum to wish her a happy birthday. That was very, very exciting. Um, yeah, amongst amongst other things. So thank you. But I also want to mostly apologise to, um, to to George Ford, I suppose, because um, I tweeted this and then um, very soon afterwards he goes on and does this and I still feel terrib ter terrible about it. Um, and I'm just really, really sorry for cursing George Ford for forevermore, just by sitting in his seat. Um, anyway, yeah, thank you, and I'll see you very soon. You look up at the clock, you realise it's not done, so you can't celebrate, then you want to again, then you can't. Was your head just spinning at that point? Yeah, trust me, Flats, about four years ago, I learned not to celebrate early. Yeah, um, remember that well. So, uh, remember that well. I didn't want to make the same mistake again. <laughs>